All right. Hi. Hi. Let's see any grace. I hope everybody is doing great. Oh my gosh. Such a, such a good day, crazy times, but good day. And, um, I have been getting a lot of questions on something that is very different about this naked mind and the book and the methodology and all the things. And so I wanted to get on here and kind of bust some myths and clarify, um, but here's the thing. I talk a lot about this concept of the first step in changing your relationship with alcohol is to stop trying to stop drinking. And I call this the pause. And the pause came from my own journey. I mean, here's where I was. Okay. So for years and years, I was doing what every other mom around me was doing. Every other, you know, colleague around me was doing, my husband was doing, my friends were doing and drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. And of course, slowly social drinking and out at work drinking became drinking at home and self-medicating for intense stuff like postpartum depression with my second son. And I found myself at a place where I was like, okay, my gosh, like this, the thing that I think is really the thing keeping my life all together, which is my, my red wine is actually really tearing my life apart. And so I was at this place in my life and I was like, oh my gosh, like the thing that I think is like my best friend, the thing that I look forward to every day, the thing that I count on to be more present for my kids or, you know, intimate with my husband, all of these things actually has this really dark side. And this dark side looked like me waking up in the morning at three in the morning and just laying there in tears because I couldn't remember how much I drank the night before. And because I felt so much anxiety, it was like having gasoline poured into my stomach and I it was, you know, energy and intensity and pain. And it was just so painful. And I'd cry and beat myself up and be like, who, who are you? Like, this isn't the mom you want to be. You don't want to be the mom who's, you know, literally falling asleep with a glass of wine at my bedside every single night. Uh, you don't want to be the wine whose son comes up to you and tells you he doesn't want to snuggle because your breath smells bad and your teeth are purple. Like, and it was just all of these signs and signals saying, wait a second, this thing that you thought was the key, this thing that you thought was the best thing is actually not the best thing. <laughs> it's actually really hurting you. And so I did what anybody would do is I was like, all right, you know, no problem. I'm smart. I'm in control. I'm like super successful. You know, I'm all high on myself and I'll just cut back. And I did. And every time I did, I felt really deprived. I felt like I was missing out if I, you know, was deciding to take a week long break or, and I, that deprivation lead to me saying, forget it and, and drinking more. And I entered this cycle of making promises to myself, you know, promises like I'm not going to drink till Thursday, or I'm only going to have two glasses of wine, or I'm not going to drink anything until the weekends, or I'm going to take a 30 day break just to show myself I can, whatever these promises were. I make all these promises to myself and I break them, break them, break them, break them. And I entered this period of time that lasted for years, frankly, where I was escalating and trying to cut back drinking. Every attempt I made ended up resulting with me drinking more and eventually like really losing all trust in myself, uh, finding myself at a really low point, you know, very low, probably some of the lowest a human can go because I really felt worthless. I felt like you know, my family would be better off without me. I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand why it was, uh, seemed like I was together in all these areas of my life. I, I didn't struggle with too many things. I had all the things on the outside that like you want in life, you know, the husband, the job, the kids, the dogs. And yet here I was just like internally in absolute misery because I both wanted all the drinks all the time and wanted to not be drinking as much anymore. And really wanted to get back in control because I knew that how much I was drinking was not reflective of the mom or the wife that I wanted to be. And so at this point in my life, I had this moment of, I don't know, I mean, it must have been like the universe conspiring, call it divinity, call it just, I don't know what it was, but I was coming back from London. I was in a train tunnel in Heathrow Airport, and I had been out drinking super late the night before. Uh, with colleagues and i'd been on this business trip again my the company i worked for was headquartered in london and i was coming home and i had gone into the hotel bar for breakfast super hungover i probably had gone to bed around 3 34 
very drunk, woke up still drunk, but also starting to feel the hangover, went into the hotel bar for breakfast. And I asked the waitress, I was like, Hey, can I have a mimosa? Cause you know, mimosas, mimosas are totally cool in the morning. No problem. It's a normal thing to do. And she told me, she's like, well, you know, it's, it's like six in the morning. Like, unless you're planning to drink the whole bottle, I can't open a bottle of champagne just for you. It'll be flat by the time anybody else orders a mimosa. And I was like, oh, no, no, of course, of course, I would never drink a whole bottle of champagne. Who would do that? You know, all the while being like, yeah, of course, yeah, I'll drink it, <laughs> whatever. But it would be very typical of me to drink a whole bottle of champagne. You know, it would be typical of me to drink two bottles of wine at this point. And, you know, I'm not humongous. I'm tall. I'm 5'8", 140, 145 pounds at this point in my life. But I could put away two bottles of wine a night. It was crazy. And so anyway, so I shrugged that off. No problem. She goes, but I could, I could offer you a vodka, um, orange juice, a screwdriver. And this was one of those kind of invisible lines in my head that I hadn't crossed. Right. It was like one of these lines, like, okay, as long as I'm not drinking hard alcohol at six in the morning, like I'm still cool. We're still okay. Like, yeah, I don't love it, but I'm still not, you know, an alcoholic. If that's not the case, I'm still, I'm still not that bad. And so I had this invisible line in my head and, but this morning I was, I was miserable. I was, I was hungover. I was going home. I knew I was bringing the worst of me back to my family when they deserved the best. I just wanted to dull the pain of that. And I was like, you know what? Yes. And so I actually had two or three of those before I got into the taxi to get to the airport. And so I'm sitting there in the airport and I'm journaling and I'm crying and I'm in the tunnel. People must have thought I was crazy. I was like typing. All my journals were on my, had a little um, iPad with a, with a keyboard. And that's where all my journals was, like, typing, 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 crying, crying, crying. You know, people were walking by me like, what happened? They must have thought something super tragic happened. And I remember just typing the words like, like, I need a new question. Like, what is wrong? Like, why? And so all of a sudden, instead of the questions I'd been asking myself, which were like, what's wrong with you, Annie? Are you an alcoholic? Why can't you get it together? Like, what is the problem with you? I started asking a different question and I was like, why is this happening? Why is it that I used to be able to take it or leave it? Why is it that I used to be able to just like drink on occasion and then let it go? Like what has changed? And that question, I was like, huh? And so in this moment of inspiration, I was like, you know what? I'm going to find the answer to that. But I knew I had some inner wisdom that knew that I couldn't find that answer. I wouldn't have the time or space or energy to really understand the why if I was still in this miserable cycle of blaming and shaming myself and beating myself up and all of my thoughts and energy and attention were going to this hating on myself. And so I made myself two promises. I said, you know what? I'm going to stop trying to stop drinking. And in doing that, I'm going to stop blaming and shaming myself. I'm going to put down these weapons of hatred, of self-loathing, of blame and shame. I'm just going to allow myself to drink. Because by the way, record shows that in the years that I've been trying to stop or trying to at least cut back, I didn't really want to stop at that point in my life. I wasn't successful. I was ending up drinking more than I had been before. You know, maybe you can relate to this. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to get off that cycle of shame and blame and that terrible, terrible roller coaster of just like misery, which is actually leading me to drink more. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to stop trying to stop drinking. And during that time, my second commitment was I'm going to find out why. I'm going to find out why is it that the thing that I think is relieving my stress actually is making me feel miserable? Why is it that at one point in my life, I didn't need it to relax or to have a good time or to go out with my friends? Why is it that when I was a kid, I was like totally happy and excited about life and I never needed alcohol? Why? And so I went on this journey and it was about a year long to answer these questions of why. And what I found out was astonishing. And at the end of the journey, I just... I mean, the truth is that I had such a mindset shift around alcohol and what it really was and what it really did that where I started out just wanting to cut back, I actually didn't want to put it in my body anymore. And here's the truth about humans. We do over the long term what we want to do, right? What we desire to do. We don't do over the long term the things that we think we should do without that want or without that desire. Yes, there's willpower. And yes, we can use willpower, but we can only use it for a finite amount of time because willpower is exhaustible. It's like a muscle. And by the way, if you spend a lot of willpower trying to do stuff like parent two young kids or pay attention at a boring meeting, 
you're going to have a lot less willpower to try to you know deny yourself that drink that you really want and you really believe provides a benefit and so i actually changed my feeling about drinking i changed my desire for drinking i went from oh i never get to drink again man it sucks so bad what if i have to give it up what if there's something wrong with me too oh my gosh now that i know everything i know i never want to drink again i want to rekindle the joy in my life i want to go through and really understand and reignite my ability to experience true pleasure because by the way alcohol numbs that and i didn't even realize it right i want to actually solve the stress in my life instead of just medicating it away to become the best version of myself and it was like this want this desire and because of the desire changing it has been almost effortless for close to six years now and so the pause in the path the Naked Mind methodology is made up of four steps, P-A-T-H. And the first one is pause. And the pause is the most controversial one <laughs> because the pause says, give yourself a break. Stop trying to stop. Put down those weapons of blame and shame. Take a breath. Learn what alcohol is doing in your body. Learn the neurochemistry of it. Learn the biology of it so that you can have a little bit of self-compassion so that you can realize that you're not broken, that there's nothing wrong with you, that you're not like this cursed fragment of the population that is somehow different than anybody else, that you're actually just a human being with blood and flesh and bones and human beings with cells in reaction to alcohol do certain things. And then we answer all the questions. Well, why do some people drink more and some people drink less? Why don't some people seem to have a problem when others do? Why do some people quit so easily? Like. There's actually answers for all of that. There's science that backs up all of that, that helps you understand it in a way that you can let yourself off the hook, that you can do what I did, and you can put down the weapons of blame and shame, and you can stop trying to stop long enough so that you can learn self-compassion and that you can learn about alcohol and actually change your desire for it. Because once you change your desire, Wow, the whole game changes, the whole conversation changes. So if you want to learn more about this and what the other steps in the path are, visit nakedmindpath.com and, you know, check it out. It is like nothing else. And it's so controversial because, hello, <laughs> how counterintuitive. People are like, hey, I want to stop drinking. I'm like, okay, first step, stop trying to stop. <laughs> of course people are going to look at me like I'm crazy. Of course I'm going to get lots of hate mail about that. Uh, you should see the emails. It's it's intense, but this was my path. This is the way that I really did it. And that's, you know, if you read this Naked Mind, the book, the first thing it says is don't stop drinking while you're reading this book. And that's the same idea. It's the same idea. So if you want to learn all about it and all the rest of the steps of the path, visit nakedmindpath.com. And, you know, just no matter what you do, if you're watching this video, take a breath, let yourself off the hook and realize that you've really, truly been doing the best you can with the tools you have. And you just might need some more tools. If you asked me about the one thing that makes this naked mind so different from anything else, I would have to say emotion. It is the emotion that people feel when they're really ready to make a change, when they've had that mindset shift, when they've gone through all the materials and the methodology, and they get this feeling that it's not that they never get to drink again, it's that they never have to drink again. And interestingly, according to all sorts of new research, it is emotion, especially positive emotion, more than anything else that predicates how long a change will stick, how long it will last. It is emotion. When you feel excited about the change in your life, when you feel thrilled that you're making this new difference, instead of feeling deprived or like you're missing out, everything changes. And it really makes it that this naked mind can stick for the long term. If you want to know more about how to truly change your emotion around drinking, I want you to join me at nakedmindpath.com. It is the path to changing your emotion, changing your feelings, and really finding freedom in your relationship with alcohol. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.